Hey, it's Zach Gordon, and you are watching the Permanent Rain Press. Hi, everyone. It's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press. Today, I am happy to be joined once again by Zach Gordon. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, and it's so lovely to be reunited with you. And after all this time, uh, a lot of time has passed for both of us, so I'm excited for us to catch up and to uh, be on the show again. I know it's it's been a long time, but it's been such a busy week for you. So we're so grateful uh, that you are taking the time to catch up. It was your birthday on Wednesday, debut single release on Friday. And it's just like a full circle moment because we were just saying that when we last spoke in 2020, you were talking about your passion for music and you just kind of started seriously songwriting at that time. And now today we get to chat about the new song, Time Bomb, which just came out. So uh, can you take me through the creative process? Like what was that initial idea and how did it blossom into its final version? Wow. Well, first off, um, thank you for definitely bringing me back uh, two and a half years. That's how long it took to get my first song out. So um, it's pretty crazy. I think that as you know, I always wanted to do music and it was something that I was still getting better at and working through. And And I think it always takes time to find your voice and especially what you want to write about, whether that's music or or acting or you're a, a painter, songwriter, etc. Um, so in terms of this song, I actually had gotten out of a relationship maybe, it's it's been a year now, so it feels like forever. Um, but at the time, the way that I wanted to deal with that pain and that um, that loss Instead of, I feel like normally when I was younger, I would try to distract myself and pretend that I didn't care about things. And I feel like that's a common theme, especially in today's culture. But I was done. I was hanging up the cape and I, I realized that I had been training myself to essentially walk through what I was dealing with. And that was through songwriting, through making music. And for a long time, it was screenwriting. And obviously, when you're an actor, you can channel those emotions into a project, a film, um, even a voiceover job. But at at this point where I was at, it just felt like the only thing that made sense. And so Time Bomb was really a a mix of of processing. Really, what the song is about is about grieving. It's about realizing that a relationship, a friendship, uh, a partner, we weren't right for each other. And and breaking up with not just that person, but the idea of, you know, who you thought they were and who who you thought you were in that relationship. And so, um, so grateful that one that was documented. I mean, now that I have moved on and I'm just in a totally different place in my life, I'm so grateful that like, as difficult as it was, like I forced myself to sit down, lock myself in a room and just wrote about how I felt and wrote and wrote and erased and rewrote and tore it apart and that song took 10 months to create and and not so much because the idea wasn't already ready but because it was a battle with as the song continued to grow and change and the elements were being discovered so for example I wrote it on acoustic and then I brought it to producers and then we tried all these different elements and then a songwriter helped me articulate what I wanted to say a little bit better so shout out to Peter Strupp who's in a band called Arms Akimbo. He's uh, an incredible songwriter, helped me bring this to life, what I was feeling and dealing with. And uh, shout out to The Fund. They are the producers that really brought this track to life. So that being said, um, it took long because I knew that the emotions and what I was feeling were already captured, the structure, the foundation. But again, translating that to a track that, you know, ideally tens of thousands of people are going to listen to and hopefully in a decade from now, millions, maybe not that long. We'll see. I'm just going to keep plugging away and my expectations are non-existent, just trying to make the best music I can. But that being said, it came from a, um, a painful place, but dealing with what I was going through, I felt like it, it was the only thing that made sense. And then bringing it to life as a whole other project and now marketing it. Now I'm sitting here talking with you and, and me being a nostalgia junkie and someone who, who loves, um, emotion and, and documenting things in my life. I'm so grateful that this is how I chose to process this um, this moment in time. So, and it'll live forever. And, and hopefully people will hear it, identify with it, and, you know, it'll take on a life of its own. 
It does sound like a very cathartic process for you. Um, I'm glad it kind of helped you heal. And I wanted to talk about the kind of acoustic feel that comes through. I know that you work with a producer, so it's kind of polished, but I love that we can kind of hear your voice clearly, especially in the more falsetto parts. So did you always know that you wanted it to go this route rather than like use a lot of, let's say, different um, production elements, synths, because I know Coldplay is one of your influences, but um, on the other hand, so was like Ed Sheeran and John Mayer. So when you were thinking of your debut single, like, did you have a really strong sense of where you wanted it to go? Hmm, that's a great question. And plain and simple, it took so long because I didn't have a clear direction and I knew where a lot of my inspiration came from. Like you said, doing your research as always, I love you for that. Um, it was tricky because like I said, the song was birthed on acoustic in a room, basically alone with me and the songwriter and, and all this emotion that was pouring out. And, and now in my process, I like to honor that because I don't even think it's mine. It's just sort of downloaded from the universe. And I feel like that's, that's something that I've gotten better at over time. And so it was, the challenge was going, Hey, how can I take this to somebody that didn't go through what I went through that has no idea what I went through, but also how do we honor that and make it entertaining? And so, um, I just went to the studio over and over and over and over again with these guys, the fund. And, um, I I'm sure at times they wanted to pull their hair out, uh, because I, I think when you are paired with an artist who doesn't really know which direction he wants to take it. And, and basically when he's saying, Hey, I want to keep the authenticity of how, what I was feeling and, and, you know, the pain and also like, you know, the acoustic element, but make it more entertaining. And so I feel like we just tried so much and added things and took things away. And, and really at the end of the day, that's what the process was, is I, I respond to feeling. So when I wrote these lyrics, I followed my heart and followed what I was feeling and that wasn't as much a conscious process. And I think the production aspect was similar. I really just had them play me a bunch of different sounds. The guitar part, I go, -na 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 -na. like that was, I butchered that, but, um, uh, but that was, I feel like also downloaded from the universe in the room at the time. I, I, I hear uh, instrument patterns or vocal patterns and the way I articulate them is just by singing them. And when someone introduces an idea let's just say like you said a synth or a piano i go hey try a different instrument try some bongos try some drums uh try a, a a ukulele and i have to hear it and then if i respond to it emotionally that's when i go yep let's follow that and so it's every layer was was that's really how it all unfolded and then obviously they added their touch and their influences and they're just tremendous uh so Again, the track wouldn't be what it is without them. And um, again, tedious, but the others aren't as tedious. Like now moving forward, like like you said, having inspirations and now going through the trial and error period, I feel like I have gotten better now at not only communicating with other musicians and producers, but uh, uh, trusting those instincts that you know I'm good at and then also trusting what other people are good at. So I think that's the process and that's what makes it fun. I think as long as you're kind of growing and learning as you go along, that's really all you can ask for. Um, there's a line that really sticks out in the song. Uh, tell me about the line. I want to call your mom up just to thank her. It's a shame the way she raised you. Because I sense a little bit of bitter, which I think you are allowed to be and feel 100%. So what kind of um, let that line make the final version of that song? So funny. I, and you're when you were saying that, I was like, she's not going to pick that line. She's not going to pick that line. That's my favorite line in the song. And I'll tell you why, because it was probably the most honest thing that I wrote. And it's so petty. It's just so petty. And like you were saying, bitter, but really not to bring it full circle and make it about the entire song as a whole. But when I wrote that, I was really in the process of like, when I say the stages of grief, one minute I was like, I miss this person and I need to be with them. And the next was, I'm so angry at you. I never want to see you again. And that moment was where that line was birthed. Right. And then talk about other petty things like, like, you know, I want to drop your toothbrush in the toilet accidentally, you know, like I want to watch a movie and then spoil it uh, not to butcher the lyrics, but um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where th the song, 
think had this balance and it was unconsciously un- unconsciously it was unconscious um where at moments i felt petty and when you're angry you do feel petty and, and it was like that's a little childish but i wanted to honor that and then it was also going well when you follow up the toothbrush line the next thing is i want to burn the t-shirt you gave me i could keep it but you didn't want to keep me and so i think that was always the goal was balancing that bitterness with well It's not really about I'm angry at you. At the heart of the matter, it's I love this person or I miss this person and I'm sad about what happened. And so it was sort of honoring that and uh, and not shying away from maybe looking a little childish. But at the end of the day, you know, emotions, they come and they go and and we feel them so deeply, hopefully, um, if we allow ourselves to. But I think that's that was the goal with this was just to honor exactly every emotion that I was feeling. And, uh, and even times happy, like, like I, I remember one time I was singing that and I was like, man, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to be out of that. But then it sw- switches to, I'm so sad to be out of it. So I just wanted to balance all that. I hope that answered the question. Um, but yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think it does really capture that duality. And like you mentioned, you went through all the emotions. So really like this song is just a package all together. It's not just the good and the bad, but like everything in between, uh, you talked a bit about you know learning to follow your instincts more when songwriting um, the word you've used before is creating in a visceral way so when do you like know that you have an idea that you want to come back to whether you record a voice note in your phone or jot an idea down like how does that kind of process work for you Hmm. so I would say that I'm learning I am good at certain things and other things I need to work on And so one of the things that I feel, and maybe it's translated from acting, is someone gives me a script and my job is to bring it to life and honor the emotion, right? And and a technique that I studied for a while was called the Meisner technique. So basically, it's all about paying attention to the other person and, and working off of them. And so really, every line is different. You know, you make your choices, but it's, it's all happening in the, in the moment organically, it's not planned. And so I think when it comes to music, my creative process is someone plays me a melody, a, a, a song, a couple of chords on a guitar, or I'll play them, right? I play guitar and piano. And whatever I respond to emotionally, I just start mumbling. And sometimes I say, like, I probably started singing like, ticking time, you know, like, and I don't even know what I'm saying, right? And so then it's like, huh, well, what would work with time bomb? Well, well time bomb, fuse, right? Um, lose uh and then sort of like mumbling when you said you love me oh man you were lying or uh, i knew you weren't telling the truth i knew it wasn't true so you sort of follow the thread and you don't judge it at least you try not to um and then you let it sit for a little bit and you never know if an idea is really gold and i think that i had a pattern of wanting things to already be finished the moment they were created and And that can actually alter the creative process because if you're already judging it, then it's never going to be what it's supposed to be. So you have to allow it to happen. So that being said, I have thousands and thousands of voice memos on my phone. I I probably songs that maybe would move my career in a crazy direction, but I've just got so many. And I, I just, I I did five just today. I I met up with my, uh, a guitar player that I work with often. And like today we came up with five and a couple of those are great. And, I, I can just come up with them just quickly. So but the problem is one, what do you do when you can come up with so many ideas? That doesn't mean they're all great, you know? And the only way to really discover them uh, is to push through them. But again, like to get something like Time Bomb from A to B to now the final product took 10 months. So like, can I afford to spend that time on all these tracks? No. So naturally, naturally a lot of them will be lost in, in translation and time. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to get better at finishing things the moment they're created, but that's not always possible because like I was telling you before this call started, I'm, I start work on a new, uh, video game next week. I'm not allowed to talk about it, but hopefully in a couple of months I will be able to. And, uh, that's going to take up my next few weeks for days and days and days. And so I, I actually had to move a bunch of my studio sessions and ideally I would create these songs in the room with these people. We'd honor what the create creative et cetera, was being downloaded from the universe. We'd make it there. And then that would be documented. But if they're living on a voice note, 
every day I change, my emotions change, and you can't really pretend like you're in the same place that you were when they were created. So I'm actually struggling with that. I'm, I'm trying to go back to songs that I wrote when I wrote Time Bomb, songs I'm so proud of. But I, I just, I was in Nashville last week. I'm going all over the place, but it'll, it'll make sense. I was in Nashville last week. I had a gig out there with Grayson Russell, who's an incredible musician. He played Fregley in the Wimpy Kid movies. And we had a, a plan to record another song I wrote 10 months ago, 11 months ago, right around the time of Time Bomb. And uh, we didn't have time because I started writing something else, which now is going to be the next song that I am releasing, which I'm so proud of. It's not that because I'm not in that place anymore, but I don't know when I'm going to finish that song and the five others that I was proud of that I, I wrote there. So it's been tough, long story short. And like the biggest lesson I'm learning is don't judge it, get it done as soon as you can and put it out. So yeah, that's, it's been a, a big challenge. Yeah. Like essentially it's, it's not a linear process uh, so far. So I think you're trying to find a way to streamline it essentially so that, you know, you're proud of a song in a moment, but life comes up. Hey, we're really excited to hear that you booked another project and you're keeping busy, I guess, as someone who is an actor and musician now with all these different forms of mediums and arts, like you have to try to find that healthy balance. Uh, you mentioned, you know, Nashville, you've been back and forth recording there. Uh, how has that experience been? I mean, such a rich music history industry out there, um, but you've been spending a lot of time in studio. Yeah, I have to give credit where credit's due. That would not be possible without Grayson. He is, he's actually been a, a musician longer than he's been an actor. So for those of you out there who are fans of not only Wimpy Kid, but he was in Talladega Nights as well. And he's just, things are really taking off for him too. He's about to uh, play a 30,000 uh, festival, like in a couple of months. He found out while I was with him last week and he's working on a TV show now and cutting his own album long overdue in my opinion. But uh, that being said, he knows a lot of incredibly talented musicians out there in Nashville. And I, I always... When I go there, I, I I think it's hilarious. You could throw a rock and hit like five incredibly talented musicians. It's it's wild. Like in Los Angeles, like you could throw a rock and you know hit a bunch of influencers maybe, and out there it's musicians. So it's it's pretty crazy. Um, hopefully no one's hurt by the rock. Uh, definitely not my intention. Uh, that being said, yeah. So I go out there, we perform whenever I'm out there, just to you know get the reps up, and I'm trying to get better. So when I do eventually tour. I'm not just showing up and saying, hey, guys, uh, I didn't really get the reps in like I did for the songwriting and singing aspect. So uh, it's all about getting the reps in. And I've been working with some incredible musicians, Bryson Maggard, uh, Caleb Hinton, bass player who played bass on a track I'm releasing in a couple of months. I'm so excited about. Um, but these guys are young. They're hungry. They're dedicated. And uh, they're very hardworking. And I think you can't go wrong with that mix. And it's clear that they are friends of Grayson's because he's just the same. So um, that's what I love about Nashville. And I think the coolest thing about Tennessee, et cetera, we actually perform in Cleveland, which is a, a couple hours away from Nashville as well. Um, but that's where a lot of the musicians attend school and university. And the coolest thing I, I like about the coolest thing I like, one of my favorite things about Tennessee is that my experience with the people there. And it's not that the people are different in other areas, better or worse. And, uh, and I'm certainly, you can find good people everywhere. But in Tennessee specifically, I've never met more people who just want to work on whether that's songs, collaborate, help out with a, a show or a gig, and, uh, and, and really expect nothing in return. And they're kind, they're thoughtful, they're empathetic. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm starting to think that what they all have in common, you know, whatever anyone believes on this uh, chat, you know, everyone ha can believe whatever they want genuinely. Um, but they all are grounded in their faith. And, and that's what I took away from going to Nashville uh, so much is, is just that those traits were, um, were very common in people that were grounded in their faith. So it was just an interesting observation. And uh and, you know, and, and I spent a lot of time in San Francisco visiting my brother and and uh, New York visiting some friends. And it's just the cultures are different. And Los Angeles, obviously, is, is a beast of its own. Everyone's really trying to just maximize their potential out here. I, I feel like there's no other place in the world that exists where you get people from all walks of life with the sole goal of just 
I have a, a dream and I am here strictly to accomplish it. And there's nothing wrong with that either. But it's just, I've, I've gotten quite the culture shock recently, just making music in so many different places and meeting so many different people. And probably for the better, because it's nice to know that not everything is just like Los Angeles and not because Los Angeles is bad. It's just, it's nice to know that the world isn't a bubble, even though it sometimes feel like it might. It really sounds like a place that that works on building that sense of community, at least music wise, like you mentioned, not that it can't happen elsewhere, but just it, you felt it so strongly in Nashville with the people that you met. Um, did you get to check out any local spots, local eateries, or was it all time in the studio? You have to have gotten around a bit. It's so funny you ask that. I am very conscious of what I eat. I try to eat healthy uh, unless I'm binging on sugar because candy is like my my secret addiction. I guess not so secret. So when I'm not uh, helping myself to a couple of sour gummies, we didn't have a lot of time. You know, the one thing I like about working with Grayson and these musicians is <clears throat> I'm only there for a certain amount of time because I can only carve out a week or two. And so from the moment we go to sleep, after we're done writing or we leave the studio, we wake up, we go right back to the studio. And it was tough. The only thing that I could eat around there was Hibachi Express, um, which I got salmon with veggies. Uh, and I literally, say, I would, yeah, no, no a bull riding or barbecue for, for Zach. I really watched myself. I think my guilty pleasure is there's this diner over there called City Calf. And what I love about it is not, not only is it open 24 hours, because a lot of things close earlier there. And when you're in the studio till midnight, it's like, great, I, I have to eat some cashews and a protein bar again. Um, but when I do allow myself to celebrate maybe a song or a show, I get just a, a giant piece of cake from this place called City Calf. So shout out to them because the portion size of that cake is for about three to four people. But for me, it's just right for one sitting. So um, that is definitely my guilty pleasure out there. But like I said, it's it's not what I look forward to when I go out there. I think there's pros and cons that the food thing is tough for me. It really is. I have to plan in advance and and I think everyone else can sort of eat what they want and it, there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm so like, I feel like if I don't eat healthy and I'm not constantly working out, I'm not as productive. And so to me, if I, if I'm out there, I'm like, okay, if I eat healthy, I'll make better music. I'll sleep better. And cause we're only getting five hours a night and we have to go back in the studio because I'm eating cake and you know, chicken every day. Uh, well, it depends if it's grilled or fried. Usually it's fried out there, but you know, there's a couple of spots that I can, I can get something healthy. It's not as bad as I, I'm making it sound, but uh, it it's really, every time I go there, I know that I have to ease up a bit and I, and I'm pretty strict with myself in a lot of uh, areas. So, you know, it's a challenge. I feel like you have to do what you do to create like your best sense of self and how you can be the most productive. So if it works for you, uh, you did mention a couple of performances you've had two so far in Cleveland. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, but uh, Grayson's band, The Breaks, is who you perform with. Uh, how fun have those shows been? Because I feel like it's a good, it's like almost like a test screening, like in film. So you can gauge audience reaction for your original music. So how has that reception been? Again, it's the same thing where none of this would be possible without Grayson. So uh, again, always going to give credit where credit's due. His bandmates are so talented. Uh, guitar player Johnny Sawyer uh, has actually played on a couple of my records. And um, he was supposed to play on the other one that I need to get finished. But of course, uh, creativity strikes and you just got to follow it. So um, the greatest thing about playing with the breaks and all those guys is that you can trust them. They're so good and they've been playing together for so long. I think they've been in the band together for seven years that they can improvise on the spot. Now they rehearse, they rehearse, they rehearse, they rehearse. And uh, that was a big wake up call for me. It made me realize that in order to get that good, I need to put in that same amount of time. And the one thing I love about the gigs out there, which again, this isn't a, a con at all. It's, it's the greatest blessing ever, but the fans really show up. I mean, they, they show up, people, drove eight hours just to see us at this little coffee shop. And we packed that room, a couple hundred people. And uh, 
it blows my mind because I didn't even have a, a real song out. And these people are showing up to see us perform. And um, I, I, I always relish in the opportunity to, to connect with people that like literally are willing to listen to something that, as you know, I worked on for 10 months, but like something that is an extension of me, my heart, what I went through and a, a snapshot in time for me. And so like just being able to perform for whether it was five people, I mean, a hundred people, 200, it's crazy, but the crowd is, it's, the last show was one of the best nights of my life. I mean, it was just to know that I'm going to be okay, that I could mess up, mess up a line. Uh, not only does the band have my back, but the people in the crowd just enjoyed hanging out with all of us. And, and that is what I'm glad I took away because I think for a while I've been nervous about what's the result going to be. I need to get a billion streams to, you know, like all this stuff that is irrelevant and it's just your mind sort of playing tricks on you and, and not things I really focus on. But when I've given an opportunity, when I was given an opportunity to really just be like a placeholder for, you know, Grayson and the breaks for that one, a couple of songs. And then the crowd was so receptive they, they gave a couple of hours of their night to just watch us sing and hang out. And then we got to hang out with them after and connect and hear about their stories about how they love the music, but also, you know, are fans of our films and, and what they liked about the songs. And, and like you mentioning lyrics of mine, like the song's been out two days. I haven't talked about it with really anyone, nor are people talking about the lyrics with me. And, and it, it's just crazy to me that I, not that I wrote this, but that people are actually talking to me about something that I wrote like you know I'm not just some someone's like I'm not just a a role in someone else's story like this is my story this is what I'm choosing to talk about and people are actually curious about it and uh, a lot of it has to do with the films I did when I was younger and, and recently and it's just been the biggest blessing ever and I wish I'd started sooner because I, I was too afraid to it's such a nice journey that you're on right now and you know we've talked about it before you discovered music kind of late um 2018 was when you started guitar so it's took some time but to get to where you are now is what's the important part and uh, i was watching some videos from that gig uh, of course original music uh played some tunes also covers like mr bright side uh iconic are there any other covers specifically that you like to break out into when you're performing hmm, hmm. Grayson was very adamant on us playing a song called atlantic city and i think the the version is by a, a group called the band and what I love about Grayson is he forces me, not really, just mentally to get out of my comfort zone. I wasn't going to do Mr. Brightside, not because I didn't want to. It just never occurred to me that I should sing other people's songs. And I think why Grayson and the guys are so good is because not only can they play songs like Mr. Brightside, but you know, we were also going to perform a song called Something in the Orange by Zach Bryan, which is really rising on the country charts out there. And and I, I'm just getting exposed to music that I normally wouldn't listen to. And so I think when you say what cover would I jump to, I'd probably stick with something comfortable. I'd, I'd, I'd probably go with Fast Car because it was one of the first songs I ever learned. I love it. It's easy. It's intimate. And I, I can really take my time with it. But when, you know, the guys were like, let's do Mr. Brightside. Everyone loves it. We all love it. And the crowd's going to love it. They were right. They were right. I would have never picked that song. And it was probably the highlight of the show. I mean, everyone in that room was singing the lyrics. People were throwing fake roses at us. Like, it was so special. And all because, you know, Grayson and the guys thought we should just get, at least for me, get out of my comfort zone. To them, it was just, it made it. Yeah, like a it, walk in the yeah. park for them. <laughs> I mean, we were learning the lyrics for all these songs the night before, and it was so fun. And, and those moments existed because of those guys. They would not have existed if it was just me. And, and, and that's what's, I think that's a true example of when you're around the right people. You know, I'm, I'm sure you, hopefully you have a few of those people in your life, but I'm grateful that not just musician wise, but as friends, like, um, you know, in Tennessee and, and out here in, in California, but I've got a good amount of those people. And I think that was just another example of when you trust others, 
And I'm going to mess up the lyrics, but if it's okay if you do, because people are there to have a good time and you're there to entertain them and you're there to connect with them and, uh, you know, share a moment. And so that was a great learning lesson as well to go, whether I covered Fast Car or Mr. Brightside or whatever, know your crowd one and two, know that, you know, you're going to be fine either way. So just have fun and enjoy it. I think you must already be looking forward to the next time you're out there and can play with the guys again. Uh, but we have been touching kind of on some new music you have upcoming. You mentioned kind of five songs in the works, but really you have a lot of songs in the works. So what's up next? Like in terms of mm. the next single, what can you share? Man, it's so funny because I am torn between three songs. I actually have three that are done, but I made one like I said, last week in Nashville that I'm, I I'm playing it every day in my car and I just want it to be out. And so I might just put those off and, and it's scary to do that because sometimes when you put things off, like I told you earlier, you feel differently about them, right? Like the songs I wrote three years ago, I would never put out, but at the time I thought I was going to even two months ago. And now I'm like, Nope. It could be the same way with Time Bomb, although I think Time Bomb, I'm really proud of that song, and that's one that I'll always be proud of. Um, so that being said, man, uh, I don't want to say what song I'll release next in case it's not that, but there is a song that I'm working on, and it's called Waste My Time, and it's essentially about how I feel where I'm at in my life, where it's important for me to protect my time more, whether that's with friends, relationships, and channel that time into things um, that will move me forward and hopefully connect me with more people, fans, friends, et cetera. Um, but what I will say is it, it more stemmed from a couple of experiences that I had before I went to Tennessee with, I feel like people that maybe weren't too respectful and, and thoughtful. And that's why I even brought up how refreshing it is to uh, experience what a lot of the people I've encountered in Tennessee are like, you know? And so I, I think that's where that song was, was that's what it was born from. And when I decide to release it, I can't wait to talk with you in depth about it for sure. You know, circling back, I really think that what we're getting at is you're all about like good intentions. And that's like a theme that you'll kind of see throughout um, not only how you carry yourself in life, but woven into your song lyrics and, and those stories. Uh, you do have some friends in the industry, I want to say in the more LA scene, I've seen a lot of different, you know, comments on your Instagram posts and vice versa, people like um, Sarcastic Sounds, Hayde Camilio, Alex Sampson, has it been nice to kind of surround yourself with fellow artists who are working on their craft, but also really sharing and promoting their music through social media, because I know that that's something that you're trying to um, kind of do more of, especially as you release music. You really did your homework. All of those guys, not only do I respect as musicians, and I'm grateful to be able to call them friends, but I admire them for the consistency, work ethic, and and talent that they they genuinely honor because, you know, it, I know what it's like to put something out and then you don't water the plant and and what happens? It dies. And I think I've been very lucky to be in the position I am to not only be around those types of musicians, but be able to befriend them, you know, and and uh, I, it's so funny. I, one of my first encounters in the music scene over the summer was uh, I went to a music event and I ran into uh, another incredible musician, David Kushner. Um, so him and, and Hayde and Jeremy, who's Sarcastic Sounds, they all, they're, they're actually, they live together. But um, at the time, David was sort of couch hopping around and they were working on music there. And it was an interesting time because I, I had just finished writing Time Bomb. And, uh, or no, I, I'd finished basically the demo for Time Bomb and a couple of other songs that I thought I was going to finish, but weren't done at the time. And I ran into them at a party and, and David was like, hey, I recognize you. Like you're doing music. Oh my gosh we all do music. We should come in. Like, let's, let's do something. Let's hang out. And so I didn't, I hadn't heard their music before and it was probably better. And so I, I figured, yeah, I'd love to make new friends and musicians. I'm, I really want to learn from people and, and respect this craft. And we just all hung out. I, I went to their place and we stayed up to like one or two in the morning, which is typical for all of us, but you know, for the sake of the story. Um, and we just shared music with each other. And I think, I got an incredible amount of validation by surrounding myself with them. One, 
because they are all extremely talented in their own fields and their own genres. And two, um, they thought the music wasn't going to be as good as it was. And I'm always very tough on myself and I'm, I'm, I'm a hard critic and um, I, I sort of chase perfection to a fault. And that's something I've been working on. I could have worked on Time Bomb for another 10 months, but you know, I chose to let it live. And so one thing that's been beautiful about that friendship is they sort of gave me the validation, not that I needed it, but that maybe I was looking for at the time that I can do this, that, you know, like I, I, I can be respected hopefully by other musicians that take their craft seriously. And I do take it seriously. You know, I take it very seriously and, and I've just never wanted to enter a field and feel like a fraud or at least people to look at me and think that I was a fraud, but more importantly for me not to feel that way. And uh, after meeting them and, and seeing how positive they were, and like I said, optimistic within their own careers and, and something that I'm now uh, getting used to, which is the content and, and building that content to get people to engage with your music. That's been a, a whole learning lesson. And I've been a student to them as well. And obviously, Leo's great at that. You, you, you mentioned him. Uh, I feel like I pull up Instagram every week and he has another video of him in black and white singing his song. Uh, and another incredible musician who I wrote a song with, his name is Chance Pena. Um, he's really killing it right now, but um, he's been a, a great friend, a, a great support. And also anytime I have any question about anything, he always picks up the phone. So shout out to him. And I, I can't wait when this interview is like our last one is two, two and a half years old, uh, however long it may be, hopefully not that long next time. But I'm excited to see where all of my friends are because they deserve all the success in the world and they've worked for it. And I'm excited to see where I am, you know, as I continue to release music and hopefully meet more people that are talented and hardworking. It's so nice to be able to to connect with people. And like you mentioned, some of them are almost at your disposal, where it seems like support at any at any time in the music making process. Uh, you also have a picture with Zach Heron, which I have to ask about from Why Don't We? Uh, I know there are a lot of comments like, oh, it's Zach Squared. So how did you two meet? Uh, Zach, first off, incredible musician and also really, really nice human being. And that's first and foremost for me. And um, I have a friend named Noor who uh, introduced us. And Noor is also a musician. He's working. It's so funny how many musician friends of mine. I'm so, so grateful. But that also goes to show you when, not that your paths change, but when I start to focus on other things, the universe opens up as well. And so I've been grateful for that too. And, and when people talk about manifestation, if I hadn't been so focused on music, I wouldn't be putting myself in positions to meet other talented musicians as well. And and not all of them have to be known to There's like Nashville. What's crazy is like, like I said, if, if, if 10 of them moved out to LA, I feel like they'd be the biggest thing ever. And I'm like, just move out already. Um, but that being said, so Zach, uh, we met through my friend Noor and, and we went to an event uh, through this company called Fanfix. They, they really have done a tremendous job at connecting creators with one another. And uh, one of my friends, Sterling, uh, she works for the company now as well. And she's been a, a huge part of, in my opinion, connecting all these people together. Frankly, I, I wouldn't have met David and Hayden and, and Jeremy uh, without her. She puts a lot of these events on and now orchestrates a lot of the events for Fanfix. And so uh, that company has just been very kind to me, you know, and um, and so I think Zach actually wanted to go. I know that he goes to those events as well. And, and so we all sort of connected, bonded and um, again, just talked about life. And I saw Zach again recently. And it's just, again, nice to have a group of people that I don't want to say maybe can relate to the idea of not knowing how to navigate through, I guess, Hollywood, Los Angeles, and you don't have to be alone. And there's people that like identify with that and, and certainly, certainly are trying to find or surround themselves with good people. So Zach seems to be one of those people and I'm, I'm grateful to call him a friend too. Well, he has been on a world tour with his than before so when you go on yeah. tour you have someone to ask for tips uh for sure we'll kind of uh segue into film now it was so nice getting to you know hear about all the insight in with your music and the industry and everything you've picked up so far uh you wrapped max day again last fall your star is max tell me a bit about the premise and what max's goals are in this movie sure uh so the film max dagan uh like you said we finished it in the fall and I play a guitar prodigy, which is ironic. I don't think so. That's what I meant when the universe sort of opens up doors for you. That was a clear example of that. 
when I started taking music seriously, other opportunities that revolved around that started to reveal themselves. And so this film, it revolves around Max. Grateful to be able to play Max in the film. And uh, it's got a tremendous cast. Uh, Rob Morrow, Michael Madsen, uh, Jay Moore. I, I mean, just so many incredibly talented people. Rob Brownstein, who is uh, an amazing... Uh, Brownstein, he'll kill me. Uh, <laughs> but um, he plays my uncle in the film. So that being said, Max is a traveling musician. He works with a, a huge, huge musician. Musician. His name's Eddie Brock in the film. And I'm his guitar player. And what ends up happening is... Um, Max's father is in prison and basically we find out that he is diagnosed with an illness. And so we have to, at least I want to get him out of prison on a compassionate release. For those of you that don't know what a compassionate release is, it means when you are having, when, when you're told news that you only have a couple of weeks to live or days, et cetera, the court might allow you to live those final weeks, days out of prison. So, uh, it was my job, at least the goal is to convince the daughter of the man that he killed to agree to let him out on a compassionate release. So it's it's not exactly a happy movie. It's very intense. It's a drama. It was very challenging, not just musically as a guitar player, um, but also just in terms of finding a role that I could really sink my teeth into. Again, not just musically, but uh, emotionally. And, and I feel like it just not only came at the right time, but the people that are on the project take their work very seriously and and someone was looking out for me. I'll tell you that. So you worked with writer director Tara Wiseman. I know that you are an artist who really relishes and values each new experience and new project. So what did you learn from working with Tara and telling this emotionally heavy story? Great question. So Terry uh basically he wrote the film. He also wrote a book of it. And he just figured that the movie would potentially come first. It just it just sort of happened. And one thing that Terry told me, because usually when I sign on to a project, I'm eager to dive into the world. I'm eager to do my homework, do my research, not only respect what the writer created, because I know how much time it takes to, let alone a song, 10 months, you can imagine what a screenplay takes. And so I knew it was his baby, so to speak. And I said, look, Terry, how can I prepare for this role? How can I give you the best version of Max? What are you looking for? And he really just made it plain and simple. He said, Zach, I just want to let you know that I didn't cast you because I needed you to be anything else but yourself. And I think that you naturally possess a lot of the qualities that I did, you know, when I was younger, but more importantly, who I envisioned Max to be. And it was actually a lot more intimidating than you would think because I'm when I told you earlier, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I like to know exactly what I'm doing, what I'm getting myself into, what each moment means to me. And so sort of when he he gave me the permission to bring myself to the role, which happens inevitably, but never intentionally, I feel like in acting. And uh, it, it took a, a lot of weight off my shoulders, but it also added a lot because not that this is the actor's curse, but you know, it's it's peculiar. Why do I feel the need to disappear into other people's skin all the time? Why can't I just be in my own? And uh, I, I guess that's something I still haven't answered. I'm getting better at being comfortable in my own skin and music's helped with that. But um, I learned to trust myself working with Terry. I learned to make decisions and commit to them. And <laughs> it's funny, a, a Barry Katz, the producer on the film, he's, he's a, a legend in the, in the comedy space. Um, he basically told me that, you know, and this is so true. I sometimes struggle to get out of my own way. I, I, I am so, I, I'm so concerned with a product of something that not only am I attaching myself onto, but that someone is investing their time and money into. I'm concerned with making it the best it can be. And, and sometimes I have to learn to let go and trust myself more. And so like Barry was just constantly, I remember on set, just, just telling me, Hey, like you got the job. The job was, I mean, the audition was amazing and we all love you here. And when you're hard on yourself, just remember that like, you're the only one who's being critical of yourself right now. And I think um, in hindsight, it was just where I was at. But again, that's what this is all about is learning. And, and I just, I'm so grateful Terry trusted me and, and we, you know, we keep in contact as well. And I'm excited to see some of the moments from the film as they continue editing it and getting it ready to release, which they haven't told me when they're going to release it yet, but again, that's that's their job. This isn't my song, right, where I have to pick the release date and the marketing and who's the producer and what am I saying? So uh, 
but that being said, yeah, I, it sounds so cliche, but probably one of the most important lessons I can learn in my life. And even answering it right now is the first time, thanks to you, I'm actually realizing that that's what I took away from that project more than anything. It's, it's so nice to have that mutual kind of trust on set. And like you mentioned, it's not something that you're looking for, but that validation sometimes from coworkers, it can go a long way to, to help you be more confident in yourself and in this character. And Max, music is a savior to him. You mentioned playing guitar. Will you also be singing in this movie or is it just guitar? I offered it. I told Terry, look, you know, I'm a singer. I'd love to sing. And Again, it was one of those moments where if we had time on set, we could have explored it. I would have liked to. That doesn't necessarily mean it was it would have been the right decision. And I think that hopefully I'll be able to put a song in the film, you know, pending it honors Terry's vision as well. You know, I'm not married to that idea. Um, anything I can do to make the film better, that's my job, you know, as an actor, just to serve the story. Um, and I, I, not my story, but I know that this is something that I think about when you ask me in terms of like, if I were to sing and maybe a part of me wishes I had, but I always think of Matthew McConaughey talking about when he did Dazed and Confused. He said that there were days where the director told him to come hang out on set just uh, just to show up and he'll put him in the scene. And and I remember his three lines or, or whatever lines, how many lines he had turned into like a week long of shooting, which isn't necessarily common in film. But he says, looking back in hindsight, that there were a bunch of scenes that his character was in that he doesn't think he should have been in and it was only because he showed up on set and and you know the movie's great obviously his career ended up just fine everyone did well after that film but i never forgot about that because it's true and just like when you're creating a song and someone has an idea or you're on a project it's important to put your own agenda and your own um idea of what you think something's supposed to be aside and honor what the product is itself and that's like i was saying you can't judge it the judgment actually hurts the creativity and the uh, I think the artistry that hopefully you can cultivate on a project. And, and I'll tell you what, it's not common. A lot of it is going through the motions and that's fine. But again, when you can create an environment where people are allowed to honor the vision and the story, that is invaluable. And I feel like as artists, it's impossible not to appreciate that. I love that mindset. It's kind of like you're saying, you know, do what you can, but also know when it's okay to take a step back. Like you want to give it your all. You want to also contribute to that singular vision of like the director, the writer, the creator, but knowing when like, okay, maybe, you know, this might not be the best thing for the project as a whole. I want to talk about Comic-Con, Liverpool, which you'll be at in April. It's so exciting. Is this your first appearance as a guest at like one of these kind of new era conventions yeah i am so excited i sounds so cliche i love london i really do and uh liverpool i've never been to so i felt like going to the uk it was an excuse to one meet some fans and be a part of a community that i feel like i've never had the privilege to and one out of fear just like music just like everything sensing a pattern here so I think that um, so much growth has happened. And one of these opportunities coming my way was just another sign that like, it's time to not only interact with the people that have been kind to me over the years, but also like explore, you know, and, and, and going to the Liverpool Comic Con will not only allow me to like meet fans, but I mean, that's where the Beatles are from. One of my favorite bands and uh I'm excited to see what I will learn when not just about music, but about people and a different culture. Right. And and then I'm going to stay in London a little longer and hopefully work with some producers and songwriters and meet up with some friends out there. And it's just, I'm excited for that trip for so many reasons. And I'm just so grateful to the folks over at, at Liverpool Comic Con for really making that happen. And so anyone out there that's from the UK and, and, and can manage to, Make their way down to Liverpool. The event is April 1st and April 2nd, I believe. And uh, I would love to meet you. Would love to say hey. And whether we talk about music, acting, or uh, hey, even the Beatles. Um, yeah, I, I would love that. So uh, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up because I'm really, really excited for that. And I haven't had time to sit down and, and make specific plans yet just because I've been in Nashville and the song and the birthday and now this new role that's coming up and who knows what else is going to manifest itself, but I'm, I'm just trying to stay present and uh, I'm excited. 
I think you need a tour guide or someone to like fix your schedule for you. But uh, I was looking at the the guest list and I don't know how much time you've had to kind of look through who's coming, but is there anyone that you personally are excited to maybe meet yourself backstage? I haven't. This sounds so, um, well, might not sound like anything. As I've gotten older, I've tried to hone in on like what it is that I'm doing and less about what else is going on. And, and not that like that is a way that everyone should sort of move through life. I'm not saying that. It just makes it easier. So I don't like fangirl or I don't like have any expectations. You know, if I'm meeting a producer, like I try not to dive too deep into like, oh, they they worked on my favorite movie ever. And that almost gets in the way because I feel like I'm there to meet and interact with fans. But when I get there and I, I actually, you know what? I'd love to hear some of the people that are going to be there, if you know. Um, I haven't, or maybe after this, I'll just, I'll just break my rule and just go look it up. But, um, I'm always going to be a massive surprise for you getting there. It's like you go in completely blind. You have no idea who else is going to be there. I mean, that could work, but I can tell you who a couple of people. Someone did tell me, you know, one show that I think is, is done so well and it's really popular right now. It's that show Wednesday. Someone did tell me that one of the actresses from that show is going to be there. So, uh. If I get to meet her, that would be great because I, I think the show is wonderful and uh, the actors are uh, hopefully they have tremendous careers ahead of them. So, uh, but yeah, um, feel free to drop a few names. If my response is anticlimactic, <laughs> anticlimactic, anticlimactic, man, can you tell I haven't slept much? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, for the yeah. viewers out there, it is um, a bit past 8 p.m. So a bit of a later interview slot. Uh, Zach's had a busy day, but we're rolling with it. I don't know if you watched the Vampire Diaries at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ian Somerhalder, Paul Wesley, that's, they'll oh, be wow, there. Oh, wow, that's so cool. Twilight, you have, were you team Jacob or team Edward? Well, there is no way. <laughs> or team that, none of them. <laughs> there's no way Rob Pattinson is going <laughs> to Liverpool Comic Con. I feel like he's busy filming 10 other movies right now. And so the other one is uh taylor lautner yes wow uh, he'll that's be there. so cool and then um more there are some other twilight names jamie campbell bauer of course he's doing mm. i think uh, stranger things now but he'll be there and a couple of the other volturi uh so i mean you'll have an interesting selection as you mentioned you are there to meet wow. fans and what's funny to me is um you're so fan friendly but it's taken so long for you to like finally do a convention and it's just you'll probably be so busy i know that i'm sure you're aware with any convention you'll be at your table signing autographs there'll be photo ops maybe you'll get to do like a little panel and i mean it's like this you'll be talking about your experiences i can only imagine how many like kind of cheese touch photo ops you'll be asked to do have you been thinking about that at all not at all but bring them on because i feel like and and it's interesting that you say this is, you know, I haven't exactly embraced this side of the industry. And I think it's just been my own battle is, um, you know, for the longest time when I was younger, I, I, I feel like I've been trying to run away from who I am my whole life. Like I'm always downplaying things and, and really, because whenever I tried to fit in when I was younger, like just people, and, and it's not that they're bad people, like you're young, like everyone wants, like you want everyone to like you, you, you don't want anyone to hate you. And then if, they do like you don't realize it has nothing to do with you but then how you view them has nothing to do with you know them it's it's on you so i feel like i carried that with me throughout my life and now that i'm i'm sort of feel like i'm stepping into who i am and music has helped with that tremendously you know dealing with a lot of things that i had to deal with and work on and grow um it's also made me sort of wake up and go wow like you you're blessed you know, I, I, let alone being able to act and on the projects that I've worked on, I have friends that can't even live out in the U.S. for more than six months. They can't be actors and actresses. And so, like, just the fact that I live out here, let alone what opportunities I've been given, you know, it's, um, it's, it's just important to find that perspective. And I think I started to get out of my own way and I started to realize and focus on what um, is in my cup rather than what I feel like I'm lacking and what I need. And uh, uh, shout out to, again, one of my friends who I mentioned earlier, Noor, who introduced me to Zach, um, Zach Heron. We were talking about this recently as my my song was being released because he's he's big in the music marketing world. And, and he was just saying, and I was like, man, like, 
X amount of people release, like, I hope like a couple hundred people save my song and like, you know, maybe it's 21 day and 30. And he's like, dude, like that's 30 more than you had yesterday. And not that I was upset about that, but I just never looked at it that way. I was like, okay, 30, like, man, my goal is still like 200 or 300, whatever. And thank God the fans showed up. I, I got more than that. But like, it was just like him just even mentioning that went, dude, you got 30 more people than you did yesterday. And I went, huh, it would be so much easier to move through life realizing that like one more listen is one more listen. One more fan is one more fan. One more, hopefully good quality friend is one more good quality friend. And we know how rare those are. And so I think that coming full circle, realizing that moving forward, I get to do a convention to be able to do that is like surreal. And, and it's my obligation to appreciate that, be kind, uh, respectful to those that take the time, just like they showed up to my gig last week that are coming to Liverpool, maybe from London. That's, that's not a, a short drive, you know, a couple of hours and, you know, other places, maybe people are flying in for the twilight folks and they happen to stumble upon me. Like it, I'm just really excited. And I'm so grateful that like, I am starting to embrace this and not letting things that I dealt with when I was younger that had nothing to do with me sort of, you know, have a negative, uh, give me a negative perspective on the blessings that I have in my life. I, I think I went on a weird tangent there, but I hope that all makes sense. I think it does. And, you know, I think this will just be a really good experience, like you mentioned, for you to cherish, like you're not going in with really high expectations, you're gonna take it as the, I think you'll be there two days, but as it comes along, hopefully make a lot more memories and connections with people um, network, I guess, when you're over in the UK as well. And just to talk a bit more about, you know, like fan support, because I mentioned you're so kind of, you're not so, so active on Instagram, but when you do post, you do take the time, read through your comments. Does it just never fail to amaze you how many different like countries, how many familiar, similar names you see day in and day out, and they're leaving these comments of love and support to you? I'll never get used to that. Um... I never gave it the credit it deserved for a long time. I think that's not that I live in the past, but that's what made me sad is only the last few years I've started to wake up and realize these are people with their own lives, their own responsibilities, jobs. They don't have a lot of time. And when they do have time, they're choosing to make fan edits, comment on my post, like it, you know, like, I'm, I'm I'm trying not to get emotional, but it's like, it's so, it's, it's mind blowing. I, I'm thinking of a specific moment on my birthday. Ah, oh, dude, this is so cheesy right now. I got, a, a, oh my gosh, this is so ridiculous that I'm getting emotional. I got a birthday message. I was with my family because my, my brother came to town to surprise me and I went to visit the family and we all hung out the next day. And, uh, I had a message, a video message. It was six minutes long from one of my fans. Her name's Ashi. Uh, I think the account is Zachary Gordon FP or fan page. They mix and match the, the fan page part. Um, and she orchestrated a birthday video with some of my biggest fans, like seven or eight of them. And they all recorded themselves separately. And it was just a six minute video of them wishing me a happy birthday. And like, I could see their their faces, they told me their names and I've, you know, been in touch with a couple of them over the years, Emma, Jenny, um, you know, Francesco, uh, and you, you all know who you are. And, um, it was just so surreal to me to think these people post edits every week, sometimes every day. Can you imagine what, what's one thing that you've stuck to every day, every week of your life? I mean, I know I struggle with that all the time, but I mean, it wakes me up. It, it It's like someone threw a bucket of ice water on me and went, Hey dude, like whether five people follow you or like your photo or listen to your song, like these people care about you. And it, it and it really made me feel so safe. I felt like I could fail and I have people that have stuck by me for years and like, Will they always be there? I, I certainly don't want them to, you know, spend all that time indefinitely for sure. Um, we all have lives of our own, but I am grateful. And if it all disappeared tomorrow, like 
that video just blew me away. Like I was in the kitchen with my family and I was getting emotional. Like my parents, we, we all just couldn't believe it. So I reached out to each of them and I sent them each a little voice message. And, uh, you know, that again, like, I don't remember what the question was, but I think that like, ah, when it comes down to the comments and I'm really starting to get to know these people, they're not just names or screen names on a, on an Instagram account. And it would be great to meet them in person. And I think when I had the show in Tennessee, it was a big wake up call to, I've never met any of these people. I don't even think they comment on my Instagram, but they're out there. And I feel like all of us can become that type of person where we just live in our own bubble and we just beat ourselves to death about things that maybe we could have done better or things we didn't do or or things we want to do. And I, you know, sort of, that's, I tend to do that a lot because I'm, I'm very, I have big plans and big dreams and I'm very hard on myself, you know, sometimes to a fault, sometimes in a good way. But that being said, that, that was just so special to me. And on top of all the fans that wished me a happy birthday and reach out and, you know, that's me answering every week, every week. And, uh, I love it because it's like, I'm lucky to be in that position. And I was chosen to do films when I was younger. And it's my job to give that same attention back to the people that have lives of their own. So just grateful, just honored. So sweet to hear the video that they made for you with their messages. And I think it kind of ties it back to, you know, you were talking earlier about things like pre-saves and streams, and it's really quality over quantity. Like if you, you take a look at those numbers, but you have these like six, seven people out there who care so much about what you do, you know, they've been following you since your film career and now into music and having them is what really puts things into perspective so I hope that they continue to support you I'm sure they will I see you reposting edits on your stories all the time so you're clearly seeing them giving them love right back Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about Lollipop Theater which is a organization you've been involved with for over 10 years now so tell me a bit about the work they do why it's important for you to still show your support even during the pandemic yeah um so Lollipop Theater Network incredible charity I've worked with like you said for over a decade their goal is to screen films to kids patients in hospitals that that can't go to the movie theater. And back before things took a turn a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to screen some of the projects I've been on, you know, throughout my career and, and visit these, these kids, um, you know, sometimes really young and, you know, meet their families and and talk with their parents and talk with the nurses. And, um, you know, they're struggling with every kind of illness you can imagine. And uh, Lollipop makes that happen. It, it really bridges the gap between, you know, what they see on screen and what a fantasy might look like. And then they actually bring it to life for these kids. And and they're heroes, not in the sense that, you know, they wear a cape and they fly around and save people's lives. But I think if you put a tenth of that responsibility on adults, including myself, uh, it would be difficult to navigate it. Imagine putting on an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, you know, they don't get to spend that time at school, hanging out with friends where, where they should be. Um, but, you know, they're they're strong, they're troopers, and more importantly, they're always kind. Now, when the pandemic hit, uh, Lollipop pivoted in an incredible way. We would do these, we would host these events called Storytime. And I would be lucky enough to read a couple of books to the kids in the hospitals, and we would do Zoom sessions, And uh, I did that a a bunch of times over the pandemic. I I remember one time we were writing a story from scratch and I love doing voices. I'm a voice actor as well. And so for me, it was fun to translate those talents and and the things that I've, they've honed over the years and like do a bunch of funny voices for kids and and read books. I wish I could have been in a room with them and, and really gotten to talk with them individually and, you know, answer questions or ask them questions. Uh, but yeah, Lollipop is is so incredible and um, just so honored to be a part of that organization and so honored that they continue to ask me to be a part of it. And they've got some real, real heavy hitters uh, behind that organization. And so the fact that I'm even 
included in, in, in that realm, you know, we're all the same, but in terms of, you know, some of my heroes are working with lollipop. And so to be able to share the stage with them is just makes me feel like uh, a, a privilege too. And, and, and also happy to know the people I look up to uh, are also caring about things that, that matter, you know? And, and I feel like, I feel like I wish we talked about that more. I feel like we, these days things, a lot of things get lost in translation and, you know, a lot of politics have just infused every aspect of art and life. And and I feel like somehow it would be great to navigate that attention towards, you know, people struggling with illnesses and, and in hospitals and especially the parents of those children. Um, you know, that it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to handle, but people are doing something about it. And uh, I hope that I can continue to be a part of that organization. I plan to. Uh, you mentioned story time, also just virtual visits. I know you've been answering questions or sharing advice about challenges, which it must be so surreal because you're looking at these children and they're the real people who have overcome such, um, you know, such, I don't want to say turmoil, but they've been faced with so much hard, so many hard challenges at their young age. So they're so strong and so brave. And what's great about Lollipop Theater, you mentioned th kind of film screenings, but they also um, help bridge that gap in other areas of the arts, like music making and animation. So uh, people can go look at lollipoptheater.org for more information on what they do, how you can get involved. You have mentioned in the past that you are script writing with your former co-star, Robert Capern. Uh, wimpy kid we spoke with rob before it's so cool to see him really have that passion for the behind the scenes development now and work on script writing so what can you share about what the two of you have been working on do you think that you mesh well as writing partners talk about another talented individual um i and this whole interview is just going to be me saying I'm blessed and grateful. And it's you gushing truth. about like all of your friends in the industry, your co-stars pretty much. Yeah. And I think because I know what it's like to be around people that don't want the best for you, you know, unfortunately and fortunately, and it's not that they're bad people either. It's that same thing of we're all just on our own journey trying to figure things out. And we don't realize that maybe a lot of our aggression and judgment isn't really about the situation outside of us. It's more so about what we're dealing with. You know, I know that that was something I struggled with, but I feel like I have so many great friends and it took a lot of work on myself. You know, I had to grow up, but that being said, uh, I, I say that to say that Robert is someone that I cherish deeply. I will always cherish. And I admire not just from an, uh, an acting standpoint and share a very incredible bond with, but um, he is the real deal as a screenwriter. He is, he's honed that craft for the last, I don't know, five, six years, diligently. And anytime Robert ever wants to chat about screenwriting, I, I drop everything. And so when he said he wanted to work on something with me, I was excited because I feel like he provides a lens that is different than mine, ironically, even though we grew up you know, similarly in childhood, but, you know, from two separate sides of uh, the globe, you know, I was, I'm in California, he's in Rhode Island and, uh, you know, different cultures as well. So he's a big history buff. So one project we're working on, I shouldn't talk about it. What I will say is we're able to combine, I think both of our, our we have unique senses of humor in, in terms of like what we both find funny. I think Robert uh, gravitates towards a lot of these, the, the political satire aspect and I think my sense of humor blends from 12 year old bathroom humor to like 60 year old ph philosophy humor. And so I think when you combine us together, you get a weird, a weird plot, a weird script and uh, something that is, if I could say without being biased, unique. Um, and I'm excited. We're, we're in the process of finishing that up. And more importantly, we're getting closer every day that we work on it. And so, you know, he's been busy adapting a, a book into a screenplay now and and trying to get that film made and then obviously i was in tennessee the song and now this new job so it's 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 difficult with both of our schedules but we're making it work and again it's just hopefully something that down the road we'll be able to talk about and actually um get off the ground because that's a whole other journey you know um but hopefully we get there and i would be excited to take on that that journey with him it's exciting. And you mentioned a whole different journey, a whole new beast is like actually shopping a project out there. But 
um, yeah, I'm sure when the time comes, like you mentioned, you'll be happy to tackle it. Uh, we're going to go through some tweets now as we kind of round this interview out. So give you time to grab your phone. There are five tweets there. So I will have you read through them and Amazing. we'll talk about what they say. And you have not seen any of these tweets yet, correct? No, I, I actually okay. haven't. Tweet number one, it says, who did you first ever stand? Zachary Gordon from Diary of Wimpy Kid who's literally the reason this account even exists. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, it's so surreal reading stuff like that. It doesn't feel like a real person, you know, which is what we were talking about earlier when people are kind enough to spend their time commenting something on my post versus being at a, a show and, and people actually showing up and watching you in person. It's a totally different feeling. And, I, and maybe I'm just because I'm a millennial or maybe at the tip of Gen Z. I don't know if that's a good thing. Uh, I feel like I can still remove myself from comments like this. Like I go, this isn't a real person. This has got to be, you know, You're someone... like, this is a bot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm honored if this person actually did create their Twitter account inspired by me. I mean, that's a real honor. Um, and I thank you for that. L R H S house. Thank you. It's very kind of you. And I uh, hope to see you at one of my shows someday. I am begging Zachary Gordon and Robert Capron to recreate the Kesha chair dance scene from Roderick Rules. Oh, man. Um, if that were to ever happen, I think... I think... I don't even know what would make that happen. Um, we need a spike ball. We need a spike pay ball. money to see this. So if you were ever short of money or wanted to fundraise, but then I was, I rewatched the scene when I read the tweet and I feel like Rob may need some more convincing because you were behind the camera, but he was really the one taking the, the brunt of the abuse there. And I think that's what was crossing my mind is I know that Rob has worked hard to transition into this new stage in his career. And um, I think that, uh, Rob would be the tough sell. I feel like Greg didn't have to do too many crazy things. Um, but hey, Rob, if you're watching this right now, uh, you want to come over and play and recreate this scene? I think we spoke because we had spoke with um, Rob before and we were talking about like what scenes do you maybe get the most flat for? And <laughs> yeah, there's that one. But it was, I mean, I feel like it's one that might, it's just burned into the whole diary of a wimpy kid films forever and that's something that I think speaks to the level or like the peak level of comedy of those films and what makes them so iconic to this day I'll never understand it I was just a kid I was just showing up eating candy hanging out with friends and and doing some lines and you know how many years later people are tweeting fond things about the movies i remember filming these scenes you know it's it's so surreal and it goes to show you that when as artists out there anyone listening if you just work on something and you let it live and you just let it be what it is i guarantee you jeff when he was writing jeff kennedy the author writing about these guys dancing in a room sitting on a spike ball he wasn't judging himself or if he did he didn't let that stop him so i think that just goes to show you that you can really affect the world if you just sort of get out of your own way, you know? I love how we're talking about the Kesha dance scene with a spike ball, and that is about letting go and affecting the world. Uh, shout out to Kesha. If she never made that song, hey, who knows if the scene would have been as iconic, you know? Wouldn't it be iconic, here we go, if they made a last Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie with the same cast where Greg and Riley are all grown up and in college doing dumb stuff like they used to, and they end up falling in love? Just a thought. Man, well, Rob, I'm ready when you are. Uh, I'll tell you what, that movie would probably do really well today. Um, people always ask me all the time, why don't you do another one? Why aren't you guys working on it again? You're all grown up. I would do it. I feel like I'm so far removed from Greg, just in the choices that I've made and, and the human being I want to be as I move through life. Maybe that would work. But also, if I played Greg once, I could definitely do it again, you know? Um, so I would be game. I think I think convincing the rest of the cast would, would be interesting. Sure, if there was enough money involved, everyone would say yes. But frankly, he Greg is the, you know, 
the biggest part of my childhood. So I think even getting the opportunity to revisit that would just be so wonderful. And I do it for free. But again, I feel like the script would have to be there. The cast would have to be there. And also Jeff would have to want to make it. I know that, you know, Jeff always enjoyed the characters being forever cemented in time, uh, immortalized, so to speak. Um, almost like the Harry Potter movies. I, I go to, I went to Universal Studios recently and went on the Harry Potter ride. And it's crazy because they have, I don't know if you've been on it. It's wonderful. And I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Th th those, those actors and actresses are forever immortal. I mean, it's like, you're looking at them and it's like, they just filmed that, but they filmed that like 10 years ago and it's wild. And uh, yeah. So I feel like that's sort of what Jeff wants with the books, but I always say if enough people signed a petition and if enough people ask for it, you never know. So Send it out Jeff's there. way <laughs> at Jeff Send Kinney. Uh, but I know that you have um, seen a lot of people from that show, including Jeff. So I'm sure these theories uh, always come up. But like you mentioned, it has to be especially the right script because you still would want it to stay true to, you know, what he wants these characters to be. And you know what? The first three films were so iconic that like, um, and I don't say that like I'm taking credit for that. I really am just a cog in a wheel on that project. But um, I feel like you almost don't want to, I don't want to say tarnish that, but who knows? I think that maybe one day Jeff will be like, you know what? It's been another 20 years. I could play my dad. I could have like a daughter or something, you know, and maybe Rowley is, is living with us, you know, in the, in the basement downstairs and, uh, I don't know. Maybe he's a vlogger or YouTuber. Who knows? But uh, I think more importantly, Jeff created the 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 world, these characters. And I think that if it was something Jeff ever really had a passion to do, um, a, a passion to do, um, I think that's English. Uh, if he really wanted to do it, then I feel like I feel like he would. And so I, I think that I trust him. And he obviously made good judgment with everything else so far so i think that he wouldn't he wouldn't make a bad call i, I trust him you know we'll see i wonder if uh, patty would be president by then well, maybe i'm married to patty or something <laughs> i know that would be, would that be the whole culture yeah the twist yeah the plot twist Ooh. thickens <laughs> yeah um <laughs> i would see that movie that would be wild or she's <laughs> or she's married to roderick or something or or maybe rowley that would be crazy anyway uh number four Let's see. <laughs> We're like moving on <laughs> before yeah, we, no, I mean, we throw too many theories out there. I'm 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 just like getting my hopes up for no reason. <laughs> Gonna rewatch American Pie Girls Rules just so I can see Emmett and feel something again. That's sweet. Um, man, that movie was such a blast to film. I'll tell you what, we 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 moved so fast on that film that it half the time I was worried that I didn't perform. I mean, I'm always tough on myself when it comes to my acting, but I was worried that it wasn't like my acting wasn't going to turn out well. And, and we moved so fast. And, and uh, I, I am so proud of that movie. I think the cast is tremendous. They're all moving on to do incredible things in their careers. And also it's just a snapshot of where we were all at in our lives. And like I said earlier in the interview, I'm, I'm a bit of a nostalgia junkie. So it's like any excuse I can have to, watch a film and then sort of be transported back to a time in my life where I was still figuring myself out is special to me. And uh, it's sort of like a photograph, but yeah, that movie is so cool. And I think it's uh, really fun for people to watch. And uh, thank you for enjoying the movie, Hannah Louise. I feel like um, people were really invested in Stephanie and Emmett's relationship. Like you and Lizzie had such cute chemistry and it's really cool to see where the cast is at. I mean, you've been really busy. I think Lizzie is going to be in um, Gen V, the the boys spinoff yeah. series. You have Darren Barnett and Never Have I Ever. And you had a mini reunion with a few of your co-stars last summer, um, Madison Christian and Natasha. Yeah, I actually even saw Natasha for New Year's. She's working on a show. She's the lead of for HBO that's coming out. Everyone is killing it, literally. Um, we're all really close friends for the most part. Um, some of the cast, obviously, you know, life moves on. I, I always say you're lucky if you have one friend from a film at the end of the day. In American Pie, it's crazy how many of us actually stay connected. Christian is one of my best friends. I was with him last night. I see him three to four times a week. 
Uh, he's just an incredible actor, an incredible human, and an incredible friend. I said incredible three times. So uh gonna go watch the Incredibles after this. Um yeah, and Natasha's wonderful, Madison's great. I, I feel like again, some of the greatest gifts from projects that I've worked on is usually what comes out of it and and not in a uh recognition stance, but usually relationships. I think that's what I enjoy about enjoy about it so much. And that movie gave me some of my best friends and I will be forever grateful for that. But more importantly, like I'm proud of the work I did. I'm proud of all of us and it's forever there. So that's the coolest. And maybe when my kids are grown adults, not before then, we can all sit down and watch it. Not as a family, uh, individually. PG. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you know, that's what's so wonderful about filmmaking is like, hopefully I get to pass that on to my kids and, um, and people hopefully continue to watch the movies, listen to music and, and, and go, I identify with that. Cause you know, the feeling I get when I watch like a Harry Potter, <laughs> so specific, um, is I want to live in that world, you know, and I want to connect with the characters from the film and, and I, I look up to them. I feel like I'm friends with them. They understand me. And when I watch those movies and some people feel that way about wimpy kid, which is mind blowing to me. And I'm, and that's, that's something I don't take for granted either. I think that like that is something that only a great movie can do. Uh, and to me, those films are the Harry Potter films, um, at least my childhood. You know, that's a big part of what my childhood was. Or, you know, cartoons, SpongeBob, Jimmy Neutron, same feeling, you know, Drake and Josh. And so I think that um, I think that that's something that music and movies can do that, like, quite literally saves people. You know, it happens all the time. So grateful that that's my job you know before we move on to the fifth tweet um i forgot to mention because you kept bringing up harry potter uh the actor who plays arthur weasley will be at liverpool oh, man. <laughs> so if See, that doesn't now, make you fan fanboy <laughs> now now i'm officially now you might have to yeah man i hope i get to I hope I get to chat with him. That would be wonderful. Um, it's so wild. You know, you, you, all these cast members are going like from the same project. And I'm like, man, I wish we got more wimpy kid folks out there. That would be so cool. Just like have the squads and then 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 a real reality TV show spins off where it's like the wimpy kid cast versus the Twilight cast versus Vampire Diaries. So like our fighting is like spike balls and then they just like, you know, are vampires and, and werewolves. So one can I, dream. Yeah. I think that you being there will hopefully like start you know, getting the ball rolling for <laughs> for more cast members in the future. Yeah, I, I really hope so. Um, I'm excited. Man, you're getting me stoked for this. Wow. All I'm just right. here to hype up the Comic Con. That's really all I'm here to do. Dang. Um, man, that would be, I can't wait to hopefully meet all these uh, fellow actors and artists and, and more importantly, the fans. So I'm excited. Friendship ended with Josh Bassett. Now Zach Gordon is my number one white boy singer songwriter. Uh, and it has a photo of my new song time bomb. I'm still adjusting to this. I'm still adjusting to this because it doesn't feel real. It still feels like the song I made in my bedroom about emotions that I felt and a time in my life. And the fact that people are right now are listening to this. It's crazy. And it's probably better. I, I, I'm just not understanding it. I, and this means a lot to me. Again, you know, like I was telling you earlier, this is mine. And it's not like someone else's project that I I signed on to or someone else's vision. And I'm grateful for that. But this was really my story. It is my story. It's really cool. People are listening to that. I'm I'm honored. And I can't wait to talk with more people about it like i said you were the first person i really opened up to about what the song is about and that's just because i haven't been able to talk about it that much yet so uh this is a snapshot in time too so thank you for being a part of that of course did you see the there's a second part i think to that oh. tweet put me on blast let's see i'm actually shocked this song is so good i thought it was going to be super unproduced and i didn't think he'd actually be a good singer but he is go off greggy i need to reach out to this person that's very very kind of them 
Super Batson, I am going to reach out to you, Rach. Um, wow. That means a lot to me. And for the same reasons I just told you, because this is like me. You know, this is really me. Um, thanks. That was a nice tweet for you to find. Thank you. My ego for the week, just like. <laughs> it just skyrocketed. Yeah. Um, again, what we're here to do, make you feel good. But really, um, we're so happy that you finally have your music out and people are loving it. And you're finally like sharing a piece of your heart, which I feel like it's it's been there. You've kind of been teasing about the music to come. And yeah, there's a lot more that you have that we have to look forward to. Uh, new projects as well. Uh, we have one more question for you to end things off. It's a wild card one. If you were to compete on Master Chef, what would you make as your signature dish and why? And keep in mind, this can be something wow. you bake or just like you cook, you make a dish. Love that question. And before I answer this, I just want to say thank you for being prepared. Thank you for caring. Thank you for asking great questions and making me feel um, special. I just wanted to say that. And I really mean that. So thank you. This is really fun talking with you. It always is a pleasure. That being said, I already know my answer. And that is because I don't know if I should be putting myself on blast here, but I, I am very consistent and disciplined with certain things. I work out every day. I actually try to eat the same things every day. I don't know how healthy that is, but my dish would a hundred percent be uh, an omelet with egg whites with peppers and tomato and some almond butter toast and some coffee because that's what I literally have every morning and I look forward to it. And is it going to be winning master chef? I don't know, but I'll tell you what, it makes me happy. So thank you to all the people that uh, get, get the groceries to the stores. You're not talked about enough. I love you. And uh, thank you for making my day. I love that answer. Um, Zach's breakfast special, but you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of hardworking people who make sure that the ingredients are stocked um, in the stores, which is what makes you happy in the morning making your breakfast. Um, do you make it for, is it just you who eats it religiously or do you make your, your family also <laughs> eat the same way? Just me. I feel like for the longest time, uh, my family used to, to definitely poke at me for that they're like and i still get it all the time you know you shouldn't be doing that you shouldn't be eating the same thing it's not healthy i'm like guys it's egg whites like hey i mean maybe now's not a good time because i feel like they're just getting more and more expensive but that just means i need to work harder and i need to save more money so i can enjoy the little things in life exactly <laughs> at your next project you're like i can't spend this on some lavish or like clothing or anything like that i really need to save for the egg whites or i can just put it in my contract i want to get paid in egg whites so <laughs> i'm sure that will go yeah. over well um yeah. i'm not sure what the equivalent is in terms of how many egg whites like your salary would be but you can do the math before you sign the next contract I feel like if I ask for too much, they'll go bad. So I can't like in good conscience, like actually do that. So maybe I'll just, I'll lowball myself for the next few projects, but it'll clearly be about the art and wanting to work with good people. So shout out to, if you're listening out there, I'm talking to no one right now. You're manifesting. Talk to the screen. I am manifesting. <laughs> um, hopefully on the next project, I work with good people and uh, I would rather not get paid in egg whites, but if it's necessary, I will take one for the team. Uh, I'm an artist first, but I also need food to survive. So just remember that. And on that note, thank you, Zach, for taking the time to catch up. Always such a pleasure. And we'll catch up again soon, hopefully before two and a half years next time around. Definitely. That would be great. Thank you for being patient. I know we were obviously trying to make this happen for a while. And thanks for being persistent. And uh, again, like I said, always a pleasure talking with you. So um, look forward to watching more of your interviews with other people. I'm always watching and always uh, happy to see that you've stuck with this and and really care about what you do. So it, it's it's noticed and I appreciate it. For all those watching, make sure to listen to Zach's debut single, Time Bomb. It is out now. Stay tuned. A lot more coming. Uh, we'll post this Instagram link below to keep updated and we will see you next time.